Welcome everyone, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about multi-solving for equitable health and well-being. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative, the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. And our core institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation. Today, Stella Lauerman is providing simultaneous interpretation and Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now. She'll also translate your comments and questions in the chat. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna give us a quick overview of CORE. Right. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And some of you might know it as a funding model that the county and city of Santa Cruz use uh, to award contracts or grants to nonprofits providing um, social services in our community. But we also think of it as a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And you'll see on the next slide that we keep uh, this mission and vision at the forefront, uh, really focus on defining and um, embodying some of these words like collective action, safe, healthy community, equitable opportunities, thriving, resilient community. And again, you'll see that equity is always front and center for us in all of our work and all of these uh, Court Institute events. And so when we say equitable health and well-being, we're really talking about creating the conditions for health and well-being. And we emphasize that these are all really vital, important elements of health and well-being that we all need to experience across the lifespan uh, to be healthy and thriving, and that they are all very much interconnected. And so that's going to be a recurring theme in today's coffee chat, just how we really think about and talk about and take action around uh, creating those connections and connecting the dots between the core conditions. And events like today's coffee chat are uh, offered as part of what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Uh, we offer things like these informational sessions, these core coffee chats, as well as more structured trainings and technical assistance. Uh, again, all, as all part of building capacity shared knowledge to be able to fulfill the mission and the vision of core investments. So we're very happy to have you all join us today. I will turn it back to Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. So today in our time together, we'll provide an overview of the multi-solving approach, which is just what it sounds like. And we'll address some of the key principles and practices that we've been learning about and then we'll have a chance to practice these together in smaller breakout groups. So just keep sharing any comments or questions you have in the chat. We'll be looking at those too, and we'll have a chance to discuss those together as well. So what is multi-solving? As the name suggests, it's just a way to find multiple solutions at one time. It was originally described by Dr. Elizabeth Sawin, who worked on global climate issues at a think tank that she co-founded called Climate Interactive. And now she runs the Multi-Solving Institute to lead broader applications of this approach. Her immersion in addressing climate change made her realize that one action could have multiple benefits and that addressing short-term benefits could enlist support while also working towards longer-term benefits. And so one of the reasons that we thought multi-solving would be so relevant to CORE was also the emphasis that she has on justice and equity. It's very central to everything that she does and as Nicole mentioned to CORE as well. So just to illustrate how this might work, here's an example that she uses from her work about burning coal. So a decade ago or over a decade ago, her research team at Climate Interactive was participating in some international conferences related to fossil fuels and their effects on the planet. And they were looking at data about the adverse effects of our over-reliance on coal as an energy source in the United States in particular. And they came across 
the data that you see here in this pie chart, which is from a reference that's um, cited here on this slide and also is part of Dr. Sawin's um, TED Talk, which we'll provide a link to later and I highly recommend. In this pie chart, you can see that the orange part is about the climate impacts like fires and floods that are off in the future. And this was the particular set of long-term effects that the Climate Interactive Group was most concerned about. But it wasn't particularly motivating for policymakers because those adverse effects were too distant, meaning after their election cycles. It was those blue areas that you see on the ch chart that are the majority of the effects that had immediate short-term impacts on things like people's health, such as through air pollution or asthma, premature births, heart disease. And you can also see a substantial effect, particularly on the health of people who live and work in the areas where coal is extracted from the earth in Appalachia. So Dr. Sawin and her colleagues realized that the people working in these other areas, in health and in the communities where coal was extracted, were working in isolation from some, some of the climate change people, and all of them were weaker in their efforts and results because of that. So that's what originally led to this idea of multi-solving. So the central idea of multi-solving is this idea that one action can lead to multiple solutions and beyond that, long-term and short-term solutions. So as mentioned earlier, the short-term important ones are, are really um, crucial because that tends to be what decision makers care most about. It's unfortunate that the world works that way, but it's also reality. So sometimes those short-term benefits in another sector might even be greater than the original target. So for example, in this coal example, the health benefits from wind and solar power in the US from 2007 to 2015 were calculated at $56 billion and $7,000 saved, while climate change damages were $32 billion for a total of 88 billion. And so when Dr. Sawin and her colleagues realized this, they started to see multi-solving everywhere they looked. They saw some possibilities as well as barriers at the systems level. So as we all know from our own work, it's really, really hard for one sector to invest and pay for the benefits that accrue elsewhere. So the research team at Climate Interactive started looking for examples and found them all over the world. And in some articles that we're gonna link to in just a moment, you can read more about them. Um, they range from things like a physical activity program in Brazil, a hospital-based energy reduction program in the UK, and a really cool green curtains program to grow um, decorative and edible climbing plants on the walls of buildings in Japan. And then there's some others much closer to home as well. So we mentioned earlier that one of the reasons we were so interested in multi-solving was the focus on equity. And this is another part of their work. They developed this diagram that kind of reminds us of the core conditions, but it's got the image and the acronym of a flower. And for them, flower stands for framework for long-term whole system equity-based reflection. It's a bit like the core conditions in that it tries to point to the connections across different initiatives and sectors. This particular diagram is designed to prompt reflections about how multi-solving initiatives have an obligation and should be doing more in terms of incorporating equity. So for example, you could ask yourselves, is the initiative that I'm thinking about implementing increasing access to healthy food and clean water? Does it provide not just jobs, but meaningful work at a living wage that builds assets? Does it improve the mental, physical, and spiritual well-being and create safe conditions to live and work within for the people who are most affected by it? Does it leave people more connected to each other and to the earth? Does it bring more secure um, access to energy? Does it really bring people together um, and, and give them more opportunities to, to move um, 
through transportation or other built environment sectors? Does it improve resilience, the capacity to survive and thrive? So those kinds of questions. And some of you might recall that we've used a similar approach to describing the connections between the core conditions from both a problems perspective and a solutions perspective. So this is an example we used in one of the very early core coffee chats, for those of you who may have been along for the ride when we started these, um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So the idea was that early on with COVID-19, uh, workplaces, childcare, and schools closed to protect the health and safety of students, of families, of the staff in these places, and the community at large. But that closure of childcare and schools had an immediate and concerning impact on children's learning, on families' economic security, including particularly childcare providers, the emotional well being of children and families and staff and their connections to the community, and also just safety um, the safety of children and adults who were perhaps in homes experiencing increases in domestic violence or child abuse and neglect that was no longer visible to anyone outside the home. And the economic security had its own uh, ripple, or ec economic insecurity, I should say, had its own ripple effects on access to stable, affordable housing and shelter, the levels of safety and justice that people experienced, whether they were at home or in their workplaces or out in the community. But at the same time, we were also hearing stories of how the COVID crisis had amplified or catalyzed uh, some creative and collective responses that increased community connectedness and generated a lot of positive ripple effects across other core conditions. And so um, staff and administrators in the education system prepared for reopening and they listened to families and public health officials and each other to make sure that their plans addressed health, safety, social, emotional, and academic needs of students and families, as well as staff and administrators. And so reopening all of those um, childcare and schools is really essential to supporting the economic recovery in our community. And um, at, at that same time, the chat that we, where we were trying to document some of these connections was happening very soon after George Floyd's murder, when many people were protesting against racist policies and systems. So we emphasized the point that if we continued to work collectively and channel the momentum of that time, the movement to rebuild a safe and just community would be inseparable from the movement for educational and economic equity. So we hope you'll see that, um, that all of these dotted lines really um, connect not just on the problem side, but on the solution side, which is what multi-solving is trying to get at as well. And also related to the equity themes, we wanted to share this quote from Dr. Sawin, which is a part of multi-solving and something we also really believe in the core in initiatives, that in working to solve problems, whether it's with one solution or many, we should listen to people closest to the issue. So I'll just take a, a breath here and see if there are any questions so far. And feel free to either raise your hand or share those in the chat. Okay. So um, the climate interactive researchers learned a lot from looking at these different initiatives around the world. And one of the observations that Dr. Sawin had was that the multi-solvers that she's talked to ask themselves different questions from other people. They're not just concerned with solving the problem that's right in front of them, that's most relevant to their organizations or clients or sector, but also whether that might contribute to solving someone else's problems. And that often means thinking about who else needs to be part of the discussion and that in turn means being really intentional 
about strengthening connections across programs and sectors. So that, that's how they came up with these three guiding questions, which we'll revisit in just a moment. They also came up with some basic principles from their work here in the United States and other examples around the world. And they include that everyone matters and is needed. So when you take this broader view, you can bring in and really put to work a lot of different perspectives and that benefits everyone. That we have a greater chance of success against tough problems if we approach them in an integrated way instead of a siloed way, which is often our default mode. And also that these large solutions don't materialize all at once overnight. Instead, they start small and then they keep growing from the learning and connections that occur across sectors and groups. So it's kind of a combination of being impatient for these larger changes and patient as we chip away and learn how to address them. And then they also tried to understand the practices that were common across these efforts. So one, one set of them would be welcoming new partners and ideas into these efforts, learning and documenting all the impacts and benefits as you go along, so not taking any of them for granted, and really that showing how that incremental change really does cumulatively lead to bigger changes, and then finding ways to tell that story. So um, what's possible to inspire people and to celebrate successes along the way? Any other questions, comments? That was kind of a very quick tour, multi-solving. And we will share some resources at the end for those of you who are interested in uh, reading more about this or seeing Dr. Sowen's TED Talk. There's a, there's a lot out there. We're just trying to provide a quick overview to stimulate some thinking here. So one of the reasons this was exciting to us was we thought it would probably have some local applications, um, either things that are already underway and may not be called this, but look and feel like multi-solving, or things that we can come up with together that are new applications of this um, principle. So we thought one of the things that we could do was to break into smaller groups we and discuss these questions together. We don't have to come up with solutions. We don't expect solutions um, in these few minutes that we're together, but we just wanted to start the conversation about either what's going on already could be strengthened or some new things could be sparked. So in your small group, um, when we split into these groups, we'll, um, we'll have some instructions for you in the chat, but we'll also come back together so you can report out. And Nicole, do you wanna go over how that's gonna work? Sure. So um, we're going to keep the group small so that um, you each have a chance to share your thoughts with each other and actually uh, kind of practice asking these multi-solving questions uh, to each other and, and answering them together. Um, and so we want to, when you get to your breakout rooms, have you do two rounds of, of discussion. So in the first round, you're going to introduce yourselves and when you introduce yourself, share your name and one problem that you're trying to address and which core condition you think it uh, relates most to. And then after everyone has had a chance to uh, introduce themselves and share a problem, then go back around and um, share your ideas for your solution. And as you're sharing your idea for your solution, try to answer these three guiding questions for multi-solving based using some of the information you heard your other group mates uh, sharing. So how does solving the problem that you identified possibly help others solve the problems that they shared? Um, who else needs to be part of the solution? And how can uh, people work together to strengthen the connections between you? So we'll just see like how, how much these, um, uh, Connections naturally happen in these small groups. Um, it might be that the groups are small enough that um, that you realize that, oh, there are a lot of other people that need to be <laughs> here in this discussion. 
Um, and actually I noticed that several people like uh, often happens when they hear that we're going to go to breakouts are dropping off <laughs> from the yes. conversation. So I think actually we'll, um, we'll go ahead and maybe keep us all together in the same room and um, give everyone a moment to maybe think just on your own about what is a problem that you or your organization is currently trying to work on or solve and can you can you tie it to a specific core condition? So I'll give you a moment just to think about that and then we'll ask for volunteers to go around and share what comes to mind for them. Okay, would anyone be willing to go first? Is there anyone, does anyone have a current challenge? Meaning what is a, um, a challenge or a problem our community is facing that your organization is trying to address? I'll go ahead and I'll go. Um, one of the things that that well, we work on many things, but one of the things we do is we work with re-entry, people coming in from prisons who've been there anywhere from like a year to 40 years. And so um, kind of a, a mixture together is for stabilizing um, both getting shelter, like home, a place to live and a job. So that really helps with not causing somebody to have to go back to prison. And so um, the core would be the stable, affording housing and shelter, but also, um, you know, the economic security. However, at the same time, it's actually also addressing a safe and just community, because if you have people who are being constructive and working and not being in a situation where they feel like in order to eat, that they have to do something illegal you know, because they have a job, so they don't have to do that. Um, and then also in the long term, it's also healthy environments, because as you, each person becomes a strong community member, the community gets stronger and becomes more cohesive. So it, it begins to, then that, that actually connects to the community connectedness. And so in a lot of ways, it, it uh, then you have thriving families, you have health and wellness, and so in a, in a way, it like actually branches out in the long term of touching all of those sectors. That was fabulous, Carol. Thanks so much for sharing that. And for um, those who may not know what agency you're from, do you want to uh, tell us really briefly which agency I'm you're with? I'm with Santa Cruz Barrios Unidos. And we, um, we're a nonprofit here in Santa Cruz. Some may know us. <laughs> We do yeah. a lot of variety of things, but one of the um, a huge area that we work with is uh, returning citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you all do fantastic work in our in our community. It's great to see you. Uh, it's great to see you here today. Yeah, and you just did a really lovely job of you know naming you know the a couple core conditions that are maybe the most obvious in terms of both what the problem as well as the solutions are, you know, in terms of sta stable, affordable housing uh, and uh, economic security, but then really walked us through uh, in a very succinct, but very clear way, how that connects to, um, I think you named pretty much all the other core conditions. And, you know, what was coming to mind as you were, as you were talking is you were basically kind of walking us through a logic model almost, you know, using the kind of an, if you do this, you know, if you can shore up or strengthen uh, resources and, and opportunities and well-being in one core condition, it has a positive ripple effect uh, on another, you know, and, and the opposite could be true, right? If, if there's um, the absence of well-being or barriers to well-being in one core condition, then it can also affect others. But that was nicely done in terms of uh, conveying those connections there. Thank you. Would anyone else like to give it a go? Share a, a problem or a challenge that exists in our community that your organization is working on. And if you can think of at least one core condition that it's related to, that would be great to hear.
I'm going to try calling out a couple people just to see, because some of you are some newer faces that I haven't seen or don't remember. So I'm curious just to hear what organization you're with and, and what your organization does in general. And we'll see if maybe something uh, around multi-solving comes just from that. Um, so I just want to say welcome, Claudia. I think you might have joined us as we were partway through our initial presentation. Do you want to come on come on camera if you're comfortable or come off mute and, and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and where you work? Yeah, I have a double screen that I haven't figured out how to use the camera with. I need a webcam or something, so sorry about that. But, no problem. Um, I was just kind of sitting in because I, I wasn't here for the beginning part of the presentation, so I didn't know how to answer the questions. But um, I work with Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, but I work in the Early Education Center. Uh, I'm the, uh, the program administrator, so working with families directly and the children. So, And uh, Claudia, were you here when we... Uh did a little explanation of the core conditions and how they're connected. And I we wasn't. Actually, we That's why it's that related to early education. And oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't here. I joined a little, I joined late. That's okay. Yeah. Um, Nicole, do you want to bring up that slide again, just uh, in case, Claudia, I'm not sure if you're, you, if you're familiar with the core conditions in general. Um, so early care and education would fit under what we call the lifelong learning and education core condition. And so we think of that as, you know, a vital aspect of well-being um, that, you know, young children need the opportunity to have high quality uh, care and learning opportunities. Uh, families need high, that high quality, accessible, affordable early care and education so that helps them be able to work as well. And so um, you can see some of the dots connected between that lifelong learning and education icon and then the economic security and mobility, because we see those as very much related. Um, can you think of, or like, how do you think of other benefits of uh, providing affordable, accessible, quality, early care and education? How, and what other ways does that benefit children and families well-being? Yeah, well, just looking at this, I didn't, like, I see them interconnected, um, but I definitely think health and wellness is another one um, that isn't discussed as much, I think. We do mm -hmm. talk about kind of, like, the building blocks on the bottom of, like, community and um, housing and, um, you know, violence-free and safe, but I think with that, um, a lot of I can bring one issue up like um like dental care is really important because it actually harms like development in children <laughs> because of like how it's connected in the head. I I I'm not we have like a behavioral therapist that kind of talks about it, but definitely in how do we find those resources for families so that they could provide that care and just like um, how much do they miss school, right, if they're sick, or, like, how do the, how are parents impacted that they can't go to work, and things like that, so really yeah. talking about um, wellness as well, right, so we work with, we're subsidized care, so we do work with people under the threshold almost to poverty level, so it's really about connecting them to resources, and then that also kind of goes in with the rest of it right <laughs> like they have the resources to get like housing and then like the healthy environment as a whole of where they're living and so yeah I don't know if that answers your question sorry yeah no exactly that's uh, another really good example of um, how the service or solution that your organization is offering the subsidized early care and education um, is not only affected by access to resources or well-being in, in other core conditions, but also how your organization and the services you're providing can also be an influencer in terms of connecting people to things like housing resources or um, 
uh, other supports that, you know, uh, support thriving families. And Nicole Lezen might be able to recall uh, statistics more <laughs> readily than I can about just how, uh, how much like uh, oral health challenges or issues and kind of untreated oral health issues, uh, how much of a ripple effect that can have on things like school attendance or, um, you know, child care attendance and how that affects, you know, working families. And I think oral health problems are the second leading cause of missed school days after asthma. Don't quote me, but it's up there. It's it's a it's a tremendous drain on school attendance, and also when kids have um, untreated oral health problems, they can't eat, they can't chew as well, they don't sleep as well. Um, it's painful, and so a lot of things are affected about your daily life. So it's it's and it's you're right. It's something that people don't often consider, even when they're thinking about health and wellness. They think of the mouth as somehow separate from the rest of your body is not the case so and people have you know social anxiety about bad teeth and bad breath and yeah lots lots of ripple effects mm -hmm. sometimes those those um uh kind of the physical and emotional impacts of things like and again in this case talking about uh, oral health uh, problems or challenges that that can show up then as things like missing school or behavior challenges, which mm -hmm. then uh, can become a, you know, a stressful situation for parents or caregivers in the families or in homes. And so then we think about things like, you know, providing parenting support, um, you know, in that thriving families uh, core condition. And so, the more, you know, the more, the kind of the deeper we dive, the more we uncover, the more uh, of these connections we can create, again, both uncovering and identifying kind of the problems or challenges, as well as the potential solutions, uh, which can lead us down, you know, a number of, of pathways. Yeah. And just related to that, Nicole, um, you know, if people have, even if they have health insurance, that insurance doesn't usually cover dental care oral health care. And so mm -hmm. there's sort of an, there's an access and justice issue in the sense of people, they're, they're not neglecting their kids. They just don't have access to, or don't believe they have access to affordable preventive routine care. So they wait until something goes really wrong, like an abscess tooth or something that lands them in the emergency room. So it, it gets back to those other issues of how do we extend you know, basic coverage, as well as awareness of um, affordable oral health resources. So just they're all all connected all the time. And I'm wondering if, since, well, let me ask first, would anyone else like to introduce themselves and say, share a little bit about uh, what problem or challenge in the community your organization is trying to address? I'm going to ask this next, and I'm hoping our two uh, brave souls who uh, shared a little bit about their organizations, because now we've heard um, two, again, they were kind of partly framed as, you know, what are the community challenges um, that you're trying to address, but also we heard several solutions in there as well. I'm wondering if um, Carol and Claudia want to practice with us. Uh, asking and answering those three guiding questions for multi-solving, just so we can kind of get a feel for, okay, what it, what happens when we ask these questions of each other? And so Nicole, can you go back to that slide that has the three questions? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. So either Carol or Claudia, or if anyone has uh, ideas, feel free to chime in here. Um, but thinking about um, Carol, you, you mentioned things like, uh, you know, helping, uh, community members re-enter, uh, our community and, and part of that involves, uh, finding safe places to live, finding jobs. So that's 
you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, right? How to help people find housing <laughs> in a community where housing is very scarce uh, and finding jobs. Um, how does solve, do you have thoughts about how does solving that situation or challenge potentially help Claudia's organization solve their challenge or area that they're trying to address around making early care and education affordable and accessible? Definitely a good question. I got to give some thoughts. Um, hmm. and anyone can chime in if if they're having a light bulb moment about ooh, how do those how do those problems connect? Or we could try it the way the other way around. Claudia, how does making early care and education affordable and accessible? to families, how might that help solve or contribute to the issue well, that I, Carol? If I work it a little backwards in the sense of like a lot of the people returning, the adult people returning, especially people who've been in the prison for 30, 40 years, they really resonate with the youth, the, teen, the teens who are getting themselves into a situation. And Often those teens have little brothers and sisters. And um, so as the people who have the experience, oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry, Nani's phone. <laughs> maybe, maybe Nani was hearing this brilliant uh, <laughs> multi-solving <laughs> happening here. <laughs> Wanted to get in on it. I loved where Carol was going with that. And hopefully she'll be able to come back on and finish that thought there about um, adults who are returning from being in prison, re-entering the community, how connecting with youth really resonates with them and that those youth may not be the ones who need childcare <laughs> at that time, but they have- They have sisters and brothers who often need the childcare. So- as the behaviors of the older brothers and sisters begin to change, they can, the parents might become more aware of um, the importance of, they probably are already aware of the importance of the social interaction uh, with, for children, which a lot of children don't get like when they get homeschooled. A lot of people are going to homeschooling and yet they're coming to find out that that a lot is lost in that for the simple fact that social socialization doesn't occur, which actually ends up creating problems in the future at times. Mm -hmm. And not against homeschooling, it's just mm -hmm. it's just social, it's socialization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but um, <clears throat> so yeah, so still trying to figure out how how we because what what comes to mind is is the monies that are needed to have people be able to have access to care. Because it's not free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so you raised a good question there about, okay, so here's an idea, but there might still be a barrier around cost. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, can I ask you, do you have thoughts or what comes to mind when you hear Carol raise that question? Are there things that you think, oh, if we know that someone is in need of or that we're uh, needing to make information accessible about how to access subsidized child care? Do you have thoughts that come to mind about how that might work? Like, um, I don't right now. I was listening, I was listening uh, uh, to Carol speak and um, I was just thinking about how we view um, early like education and learning is kind of like I mentioned it like a foundational piece. Um, we because subsidized care speaks to like a, a certain demographic in the community. I think in a lot of ways we create like a safe space for the children and and thinking about youth growing up and kind of 
sorry, I was going somewhere with this, but I totally lost it because I'm thinking <laughs> about how to word what I'm trying to say. But um, I was going to see if I could speak on the second question sure. a little bit about who else needs to be here. Um, I definitely think that these bigger issues isn't like a one agency, one person problem. I think as we saw in like, I, where they called core conditions um, and how connected they are, like people from, you know, like wildly different um, positions in the community could also join in into these large, you know, like this, these issues. Um, so I think for example, like the laws that California passes so they just passed something where like the threshold of like who pays fees for care went down so now it's I think one percent of their income so that's great and then what is that how is that going to show in the next year or the next two years and how will that funding go so you know it goes from all the way from the top to the bottom and kind of how we can show like politicians and things like that right so it's like not just localized, but like in bigger picture as well. Yeah, I think you are right on with that, Claudia. And, um, you know, what comes to mind for me is uh, like there are, because we this happens, I think, probably to all of us, right? We get really familiar with or we're kind of experts in certain core conditions uh, we know our sectors, our partners, like inside and out. Um, but then others who maybe not, uh, who maybe don't work in those arenas as often, you know, don't know all those ins and outs. So even things like the law that was recently passed that you're mentioning about changing the family fees, that there's probably a whole host of uh, people and other organizations that work with families that could benefit from that, that may not know about it, right? Or may not know how to explain it in a way that would make families feel like, okay, yeah, I, I need to learn more about that. Um, so even being able to start to identify things like that, how do we connect the dots, you know, using whether it's spaces like these core coffee chats or other meetings or other collaborative, um, you know, initiatives or, or groups that meet, like how do we use those existing um, relationships and structures to uh, do this kind of multi-solving together and, you know, make, you know, share information and uh, actively engage each other in kind of identifying how does, how does my problem help you solve yours and vice versa? Well, how about as, as youth begin to recognize uh, about responsibility that they may very well become more interested in becoming a mentor or with supervision initially for for younger youth or younger children. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, like as a like even on a volunteer, not like having the full responsibility. Because um, actually, we do have like when we have the kids club, older some of the older youth who were in the kids club previously would come and would actually help tutor the now younger children that are coming in. And so um, as they, as the youth who are trying not trying to get in trouble, who, but who were not being focused or starting to get into trouble with the law, as they begin to, to recognize that maybe that path is not going to be as much fun as they originally thought, then they begin to focus on finding other things and that might be one of the things that um, helps them to to participate in a community event and begin to do something that is responsible, which eventually also leads into increased safety with the community in the long run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of yeah, weird. and and maybe potentially uh, leads to some career pathways or ideas about like what kind of uh jobs or work would right. be of interest yeah again I love how you're you're a natural connector Carol a natural multi-solver what about others anybody else have um 
thoughts that are coming up for you about any of these questions that we're seeing here based on what you're hearing in this little mini multi-solving exercise? Any other thoughts about how does solving one problem help others solve theirs? Who else needs to be part of solutions either to, you know, here today or, or in any of the kind of, again, arenas where you're doing some of this multi-solving work? And how can we continually strengthen connections between people and organizations that are often working on the same issues or with the same people, even just from different angles? You know, as people are thinking about Nicole's question, listening to all of you, I'm thinking about how multi-generational approaches are kind of by definition multi-solving. And the, one of the things about multi-solving is thinking differently about who your allies and, you know, who you can link arms with. So um, Carol, in your examples, you know, you if you're dealing with adults um, returning, um, from the justice system, you may not be thinking about young children immediately, but those are, there's so many connections as you've described. And so those might be so just interesting from a explore partnerships point of view, let alone something more concrete, but there just seem to be so many examples like that where our, our society is so segregated by age and so are our programs, but there really are so many opportunities to to mix and match things that we're doing that benefit multiple generations at once. Like that point that you made that multi-generational approaches is multi-solving in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, final and thoughts, I'll, questions? Yeah, Carol. Yeah, I was gonna say it also has the opportunity to to really work through some intergenerational trauma. Yes. Uh, when you are including the uh, generations. That's really important. Okay, final thoughts, questions? Light bulb moments? Sparks, I think we're about to get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why don't we move into our close? We've got a couple more things we wanted to share with you before we close today. We have some resources here. Nicole mentioned some of them in her overview of multi-solving. Um, so these are sources that we looked at or, or have watched or read as, we, as we're learning and kind of building our multi-solving vocabulary. Uh, and so we've got some links that Gisela will share in the chat with you. Uh, we'll also send these in the follow-up email along with the recording when it's available. Um, so again, the Multi-Solving Institute website. And uh, we I think we had shared the Community Commons blog post really defining multi-solving and connecting it to uh, vital conditions, which is very similar to and actually... Uh, was kind of the inspiration for what we call the core conditions for health and well-being locally, um, and a TED Talk and an, and an article from Stanford Social Innovation Review. So we encourage you to look at this more. We're going to keep uh, bringing back this theme or weaving in this theme of multi-solving into many of our core coffee chats. Pretty soon we're going to start planning uh, the next round of training and technical assistance for the county and the city of Santa Cruz's next uh, funding process. And so uh, we really want to introduce this idea and terminology and, and you know, questions and practice around multi-solving as much as we can uh, before that. And then speaking of upcoming events, we've got several more uh, or a couple more uh, planned for September and then some Octo October dates that are coming up. Um, so um, we will... Put a link also, yes, Gisela has that in the chat as well, a link to the core events website uh, where you can find descriptions of each of these upcoming events and uh, regist registration links for all of them. The one that we're doing uh, next week is going to be really interesting. Uh, it'll be a presentation and discussion led by the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz. They've both gone through this kind of assessment process, looking at 
how representative their advisory bodies are uh, in terms of city and county de demographics. And it's helped them identify some goals that they want to uh, work towards in terms of increasing diversity and representation. So hope you join us for that one. The other one I wanna point out is uh, the one at the very bottom called the Learn, Do, Share with Core, Designing for Social Systems. This is an opportunity to go through a semi-structured process with us and it's short term, but there are some specific dates that you would need to be able to commit to where we're looking for a small group of about five people to participate in a two-part webinar series that's led by the Stanford Design School or D School uh, to learn about kind of methods and tools for um, designing social systems to be more effective and impactful and equitable. And so we, we're looking for a small co cohort to participate in those webinars with us and then meet a few times after that where we can then really uh, do, do the do part, practice. How do we take these tools and these skills and these concepts, put them into practice? And then we're going to co-present together at a future coffee chat in December, sharing just what we've learned or what it is that we're working on. Doesn't have to be a full-blown, you know, I'm an expert in this. Uh, but we just want to have a chance to, again, uh, learn along with others and then be able to share information with a broader uh, audience through these core coffee chats. So if you're interested in that, uh, Giselle has put the link to the Learn, Do, Share with Core overview and application. It's a, um, there's a description on the Core website, and then there's a, a Google form that you would fill out if you're interested. And not only will the Core Institute pay for the cost of the Stanford webinar, um, but we will also provide a $300 stipend for any of the cohort members who co-present with us in December. So we hope you will check it out. We think it's going to be another really interesting topic. Um, and again, we'd love to learn along with other local change makers. And then finally, um, we love to get the participants' feedback about these core coffee chats. It helps us know what works well and what to continue improving. Um, so if you can either, if you have your, your phone and, and want to scan the QR code that you see on screen, you can answer the uh, feedback survey in either English or Spanish, or Gisela has put the links uh, in the chat, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would take a moment to fill those out. And that, I believe, is the end of our session today. So we'll stand for just a couple more minutes in case anyone has questions or uh, other thoughts that have come to mind. Um, but if you are feel like you got what you needed and are ready to move on, then we will say thank you for being here, and we hope to see you again soon.